Welcome to the Prime Venture Partners Podcast. Today, I have with me Nishchal Shetty, the co-founder and CEO of Vazirx. He is in the middle of the eye of the storm and the opportunity in crypto. So really look forward to talking to you, Nishchal. Hey, Amit. Uh, thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, look forward to this discussion. Great, Nishchal. Let me just dive straight into it. You know, it seems like now we have more retail you know, crypto investors or certainly owners of, you know, crypto assets like, you know, Bitcoin and others in India than retail stock market investors, right? I don't know when that, uh, when we cross that, but it seems to be, at least the numbers I have seen seem to suggest that we're already at 2x more. So what is this? Is this just a fad? This is just something that people are over-indexing on now, or is it that it is just so early that everybody wants a piece of the kind of future pie? Um, look, I think in terms of numbers, uh, there have been various numbers floating around on uh, the number of uh, people into crypto in India. But I think conservatively, it's about one and a half to two crores. So I don't think uh, we're still some, um, uh, you know, a few millions away from uh, the, the the flippening, as they call it in crypto, which is, you know, when you flip something of importance. Right. So maybe the, the flippening might be for uh, where it overtakes the stock market investors but uh, you know here's the thing I, I, when i th- when i think about crypto while it uh, is a financial domain it's a lot like the internet where uh, i don't think we'll be worried about participation everyone who has an internet connection will get involved so these numbers will definitely drop the traditional financial markets but yeah for now that's the race i guess uh, for everyone which is you know how do you overtake the financial uh, markets the traditional ones um, Speaking of fad or anything, see, I think one thing is uh, it's been over 10 years. So somewhere, you know, that uh, narrative is uh, uh, weakening. But I guess a few more years before uh, we can all put that aside. Uh, having said that, I think the, the reason why everyone's participating is uh, a, and the, the age bracket is about uh, 22 to 35 year olds. That's like the largest. I think uh, this group has grown up with technology. And when they see, you know, uh, crypto, more than finance they see as a technological innovation that they can participate early and everything else if you think about it the stock markets the commodities real estate any other investment option we're all uh, late to that party it's been like you know uh, grandfathers and fathers were the early adopters now the question is uh, does the youth want to follow that and be like the last mover or get into a new uh, shiny uh, technology that they understand they're going to explain to their uh, uh, dads and grandparents and i think that is what is probably the biggest puller uh, we can go on and on about you know all the other numbers and returns and metrics but i think it's just cool it's just cool to be you know in crypto i guess absolutely and no i didn't mean it as a fad in terms of is it real or not of course it is and even we at prime are very bullish on crypto and defi and we'll cover a little bit of that i meant in the savviness of the retail investor People who've never bought a single stock or perhaps even a mutual fund, even a Nifty 50 in their uh, or BSC 200 in their life are talking about the price of Ethereum or, or Bitcoin or Solana or what have you, right? And that seemed to be more uh, sort of my question really. But I think you made two very interesting points. One is that it is about the younger audience, really the true millennials, right? Like the 20 to 35 year old, you said 22. The other thing that you said, which is very fascinating, I haven't heard this before, is that it's also a lot more about technology, right? And a lot more about an emerging technology trend, which, you know, folks will connect better with, right? It's like there are youngsters who connect better with Snapchat than with Instagram, than with, you know, Facebook or whatever now, Meta, right? And uh, so love for you to elaborate on both those points, the, the younger audience connecting with it. And what do you think is their tech savviness beyond as a consumer? Do they really understand what blockchain is and so forth? Uh, yeah, I think uh, let's tackle the tech seven. I think the first is most of them know what a white paper is. And that's very interesting. I've been uh, working with engineers all my life. I'm an engineer myself. I think while we vaguely heard white papers uh, till Bitcoin white paper came across, I don't think uh, most of us have ever read white papers. And today, uh, you know, uh, people in the sector, uh, non-engineers, non-technical background, they talk about white papers. They uh, talk about what they've read in it and why it can be different. So there is this uh, automatic pull towards, uh, you know, this technology where they want to understand. They know what uh, uh, proof of work is, what proof of stake is. In fact, uh, you know, when you get deep into all these Telegram channels and uh, Reddit uh, groups, you'll realize uh, the fight is over there. That, you know, some, some pe- and this is all non-technical people fighting over all these technical stuff. 
so i think uh, you know what is happening is it's just getting to be a natural element in everyone's life technology it's not alien anymore where you know our thought was uh, only tech- techies can fight and have flame wars over uh, what technology that you use it seems to be happening here um, and that's that's very good and i think uh, it's probably that progression of software going from uh, the domain of just uh, software developers to everyone um, and and i think it's interesting you know it's boring for people to talk about uh, how many products an fmcg is going to uh, release or sell uh, versus you know what is that next technical advantage that this new protocol has over existing ones it's just uh, it's just fun and uh, you know it's also completely online you sit on your computer you're reading up you get access to all the information you don't have to worry about any insider info that or knowledge that you need to gain beforehand it's all public and i think is that openness that is probably pulling people you know you know that uh, let's take the example of bitcoin um, if you do enough research there won't be anyone else who will have more info than you it's it you reach on par in terms of uh, understanding and knowledge and that's the beauty of this versus a traditional company where i might read all i want but the ceo will always know more there is no ceo in bitcoin there is no ceo in most of the protocols that have been created so i think that's probably one of the biggest advantages uh, where fairness is seen and people are attracted um in terms of why are they investing and uh, you know this uh, young population i think uh, uh, like i said the early more advantage definitely resonates with the most uh, most of them the other important factor is if you look at this market it's 24 by 7 and uh, compare that to the traditional markets where you have to decide between working or participating in those traditional markets out here you can do it in the night you can do it in the morning you can do it over the weekend you don't have to worry about when you get to participate and i've seen a lot of them being active late nights and that's like you know they come back home they're sitting on the uh, computers and they're getting into this new world for them so uh, blogging to a large extent was there why did blogging take off so much why did podcasting why is this all of this taking off is because you have the flexibility to work on it when you want and crypto gives that flexibility work when you want from where you want so i think uh, that is uh, something very attractive uh, apart from that i think the other factor is uh, you know it's just because you just need a mobile phone and uh, nothing else uh, you know there is truly nothing else that is required to be involved in crypto and i think that is uh, the the way email works why does everyone have an email address today is because you just have to sign up and you get it and that's what happening with crypto you just have to download a wallet and you're into crypto i think it's just that ease of use is making them all get into this absolutely many things to double click on uh, another thing i think that you touched on is this whole visceral feeling about this autonomous decentralized accessible fair kind of uh, access right which is almost like revenge of the nerds i don't know if you've seen that which is to say hey look now this is not proprietary access you know i have the same access as a you know mark andreessen or a jack dorsey right and and i can participate in it and and so on and so forth Uh, that might be further adding to the kind of millennial and the kind of younger people who find it cool and interesting and 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 are studying it how do you think it uh, about in terms of the you know the at least in the indian context right the participation from you know the tier 2 tier 3 even tier 4 places i was recently in a village in rajasthan and one in maharashtra as of a couple of days ago and even there everybody is talking about crypto right and uh, and it just seemed and and i'm i'm an engineer by trading and of course like we believe in it uh, so do you think that geographically also it is already kind of getting people in 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 some sense uh, with some awareness and knowledge uh, hard to imagine that everybody gets the tech yet yeah absolutely in fact i think for us uh, for example for wazirx uh, till 20 i think early 2020 we saw more signups from the metro cities and uh, from the second half of 2020 to most of this year Uh, about 55% of the signups have been from the tier 2 and tier 3 cities so it's already uh, crossed the metro signups and i think uh, there's this proof that this technology is just uh, you know propagating itself to every nook and corner of the world it's not just concentrated to a few and i think it also has to do a lot with you know if you think about it um, if you think about the stock market for example you think about oh i need to be in mumbai um uh, and you know you also know that there are always groups of people who have more knowledge and understanding you need to meet them and understand out here uh, you know you just need to be on the internet and it doesn't matter where you are from and i think also probably the pandemic where people have gone back home like we are a 300 people company today with uh, completely remote we've not met most of each other and i think the so the pandemic might have also pushed uh, people to be 
uh, understanding that from their homes they can now start uh, getting uh, you know participating into a new sector and that is probably pushing them but yeah i think the propagation of uh, this technology to the uh, nooks and corners of india and the world has already begun even in africa for example you see a lot of innovation happening around this in remittance uh, in uh, in terms of transactions because the financial systems there are even more broken and suddenly now you have a financial system that the world is building for you traditionally if you think about financial systems geographically your entrepreneurs in your country have to build out here suddenly what happens is the whole world is building for you so you get to pick and choose you get to use the best of the technology i think that is probably what is propagating this to everywhere in the world great um, so you know switching gears maybe talk a little bit about just you know uh, for the users that are hiding under a rock and have not heard about crypto exchanges like wazirx and binance and 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 coinbase of the world just a very quick sort of you know what is wazirx what do you guys do because i want to then talk about the building of the company and and so forth Sure, uh, Wazirx is a crypto exchange where you come to buy and sell uh, crypto. So the first time, let's say you've never bought crypto and you want to buy your first Bitcoin, you come to Wazirx, you sign up, you do your KYC, and uh, you transfer your money uh, to a wallet from where you can then buy your first Bitcoin. And uh, similarly, the day you realize that uh, you want to sell your Bitcoin and uh, convert it into INR, uh, which is called fiat in you know uh, in the crypto world, it is a more common term. Uh, yes. So you can then sell your Bitcoin and convert your INR and move it to your bank account. So it's a simple way to get in and out of the whole crypto ecosystem. We see ourselves as like the onboarders of uh, um, you know uh, uh, from fiat to crypto, and uh, that's where we focus on. Um, similarly, every other exchange uh, now in exchanges there are like two decentralized and centralized. We are a centralized exchange because that's how you get the entry point and you get into it. Eventually, you can use decentralized exchanges where uh, there's no middleman. it's purely on the blockchain and that is the other side of uh, i would say the crypto ecosystem great and and nishal what have you observed in terms of you know one of the uh, kind of proverbial things i have heard is that in the stock market when the stock market as an aggregate whole falls 10 or 15% the number of traders or investors if i may call them that loosely drop by 30 to 40% given that the whole you know the rise and fall of bitcoin and rise again and of ethereum and of you know overall sort of currencies has been quite uh, volatile in the last 2 3 years since you've been founded have you seen that here as well that as things crash you see lesser interest or have you seen that that sort of continues uh, through the ups and downs with respect to investor participation and so forth no i think uh, it's it's very similar see the thing is when the markets are uh, uh, in a bull uh, mode uh everyone uh, the participation is always at the peak and uh, you know uh, when it's a bear market what happens is uh, a lot of people probably want to forget about that investment for a while they turn into hodlers what we call them uh, so we see uh, the number of hodlers increasing a lot um having said that every bull market at least for crypto has been it always comes back with a huge uh, you know force where uh, all those people who were in uh, previously dormant also get activated so that's something that we've seen uh, happen it's not like where people stop and then they never come back in 2017 and 18 for example we saw a lot of people and then they went dormant in 2019 2020 second half they all started coming back again so there's a lot of reactivation that happens uh, but yeah during the bear phase i think uh, participation is always uh, way lower uh, compared to the i would say bull markets got it one quick question just on the strategy right so there are obviously multiple exchanges right you guys are there but there are several competitors for you in india and then of course globally as well right uh, there are company including the one that acquired you guys so in what will it take for multiple you know dozens if not hundreds of exchanges to survive and thrive is it largely going to be the regulatory and the kyc framework which will create sort of artificial boundaries at a country level or do you think that in this whole you know dao web3 decentralized world that even as an indian uh, in india i could potentially buy you know uh, crypto assets in some exchange in you know estonia or poland or for that matter canada or whatever it is right so how do you think about just that from say even a wazirx point of view or any other exchange point of view see i think uh, there are two components and the first is uh, are you an exchange that deals with fiat so if you are dealing with inr there's no escaping regulation or you know uh, right. doing anything uh, global 
so so you'll have to uh, conform to the laws of the land even in the absence of regulation so that's where uh, i would say it's a advantage and a disadvantage uh, the uh, advantage is that uh, you know people have to come to an exchange uh, that is supporting ina to get into it or to get out of uh, crypto uh, disadvantage is uh, you again decentralized exchanges don't really have to worry about any of the legal barriers that uh, centralized exchanges face having said that i think um, the the global uh, approach is going to be of uh, regulating centralized exchanges so there'll be more and more regulation but with regulation also comes uh, i would say confidence in in the investor community if you look at uh, coinbase for example there's a reason why coinbase has grown so much and uh, the biggest being that they go the regulated approach they take licensing so people know that there is security safety of funds and everything so i think i i see a world which will be uh, you know both which is uh, uh, the regulated centralized exchanges and probably the unregulated decentralized exchanges coexisting because as a centralized exchange I i'll give an example there are sometimes things that you can't do for example listing a new token when a brand new token comes up and you don't know who the founders are you can't do due diligence as a centralized exchange you can't list it but a decentralized exchange can list it which means for people it's a win because if a centralized exchange can't provide that they'll go to the decentralized exchange and buy it. what a centralized exchange can provide is a cheaper transaction uh, because decentralization right now it's still expensive uh, maybe a day will come where it gets cheaper but right now uh, centralized exchanges are cheaper and faster so they give you the scale and the uh, um, cost effectiveness so there's always this pros and cons which is why you're seeing it evolve today when a dex is rising let's say uniswap for example is doing billions of dollars that has not really lowered the trading volumes of any of the centralized exchanges in fact it's increased it further so so i think right now we are also in that market expansion stage where no one's worried about so much about competition but more about you know your own uh, competencies i think uh, i keep saying that uh, an exchange will only be able to kill itself and uh, you know by not working and not living up to the expectation i don't think competition is going to be a big problem because the market is just growing way too rapidly than the competition coming and and just from again from the point of view of the individual retail investor how do you think about the silos right either is it with respect to the particular crypto assets or ability to move you know potentially between exchanges between crypto assets between fiat and crypto and so forth right because one of the things that made web2 work was the fact that it was highly interoperable in every which way uh, and i'm not saying it is not i'm just saying that the more silos we have the more challenges and and more friction there will be right uh, with with respect to Uh, people's ability to participate in multiple ways yeah see it's an early market so right now we still see these silos but what is happening is interconnectivity in fact i think the last 6 to 12 months interconnectivity has become like the buzzword which is you know how do you uh, make a movement of assets fluid between different chains different exchanges and everywhere else and uh, in fact i think re- recently there was this uh, ibc inter uh, blockchain or inter uh, blockchain connectivity framework uh, which talks about how do you move your assets between different blockchain different you know exchanges uh, for centralized exchanges in fact i think uh, there is this uh, still in the works but there is this travel rule that uh, imf is talking about which is uh, when you move asset between exchanges can the exchanges also co- collaborate between each other uh, to ensure that the kyc also transfers between them uh, so so all of this is in the works early days but i think a few years down the line what will happen is you won't have to really think twice between moving your assets from one exchange to the other one chain to the other it'll just be like uh, really fluid and simple and there are these protocols being built which are acting like bridges between you moving from let's say your asset from ethereum to um, uh, solana or from there to somewhere else you don't have to worry or you don't have to worry about liquidity or the fees or the speed so that's all happening then layer 1 and layer 2 they are building it so if you see it's be, it's in the works right now um but i think uh, there's still no um, it's not a solved problem so it's being solved but i wouldn't worry too much in a few years i think uh, interconnectivity will, will be like a, a expected outcome of this whole thing wonderful uh, let's talk a little bit about the early journey of azirex right before you got acquired by by binance and i know about your background as a growth hacker well before you uh, at least publicly got into crypto and i could see some of those traces in in the early journey with respect to the community with respect to uh, you know the early participation and so forth right um, so can you talk to us a little bit about you know just the early days of just getting 
kind of wazirex off the ground and any lessons learned that other uh, you know entrepreneurs that are listening to this might want to you know how do you get community involved early right how do you get uh, you know this to happen sort of more organically and and through referral and and viral if i may dare say so from your past life sure um, yeah see i think uh, a lot of my learnings from my previous uh, start definitely helped me a lot um, but here's the thing before starting what i realized was and any time when you want to growth hack or something i think uh, the most important thing is also to find the uh, gaps in the market that you can fill in and uh, the biggest gaps uh, i found was one was uh, this was an unregulated market which means it was low trust and how do you build trust one is you bring in regulation which we, you, we all knew will take a long time so the second was you put yourself out there in front of people so when i when i in 2018 when we were uh, uh, you know about to launch a wazirex uh, before that in 2017 i started doing the research i realized that uh, nobody knew the founders of exchanges so for them it was just about you know some referrals and just trusting randomly uh, so i said how do you build in trust is i should be in front of people so that was the reason why i put myself in front of people i started tweeting talking about blockchain to build that trust that did not exist in the market uh the second was i i saw that uh, the the highest rating for any mobile app of an exchange in india when we were uh, building was i think 3.6 or 3.7 so you still knew that uh, the gap was in the mobile apps so we said we decided that on day one we would have our mobile apps and we would have a focus that will reach a certain uh, uh, like 4.4 4 plus star we didn't want to say that it will be 5 it was 3.7 so we said it should be above 4 for us uh, i think we are 4.4 now uh and then the third was that if you look at uh, the whole decentralization aspect it's always community driven everything in the protocol world is community driven it's never founder driven so we said let's build a community now to build a community what was the best way was uh, you know the, because tokenization is so uh, important part of this whole crypto ecosystem we launched and released our own token and we reserved 15% of the token for our community and we did it very simple we said if you sign up we'll give away 500 uh, tokens on on sign up today it's that 500 is a token is worth over i think 1.1 dollar so that is what we were giving away back then uh, but uh, for us it was about reserving it for the community and i think that uh, really uh, connected with the people that a known founder like who was out there talking to us is uh, releasing a token airdrop for everyone who is going to be signing up early so within a week i think we saw 40 or 80000 signups before launch and the other thing i did was i didn't i i launched this even before uh, we were launching the exchange so january 2018 we launched this program in march 2018 we launched the exchange so we had 3 months of time where we built out the community and uh, this is how we uh, you know rewarded the community and that is what helped us after that it was all about keep finding gaps keep finding solutions to those and uh, keep growing and today we are the largest in india we do about 4 5 billion dollars in monthly trading volume 10 million plus customers it's all been because we just focused on our core beliefs and we just uh, hammered it and uh, we don't try too many things uh, the biggest problem is when you you know try too many growth hacks so it's just one growth hack uh, it's not a hack also just uh, support the community go after them do what they want and that helped us can you talk about certain examples of where the community led you to places that you would have otherwise not gone or even perhaps pushed back on right i mean there are many examples from the web 2 world uh, like from ebay and other sort of uh, 20 years ago but um, uh, either of azirex and if you're not comfortable just in general in the crypto space yeah see i think uh, there are quite a few instances uh, in fact i think a lot of the things that we built uh, for us what happens we as founders we always read about steve jobs and how uh, he knew more than the customers and he innovated but i think i think those are exceptions and uh, not everyone is i think no one is steve jobs so the best way for us has been listen to what people want every feature that we built has been a result of people asking us so we've never uh, you know and i think we tried once to innovate we failed uh, that feature did not take off so what we done is every time people ask for something we build it it's been that simple and uh, you know even uh, i think even marketing like people started asking us why not have trading competition so we launched trading competition it worked so whenever we see a lot of people asking for something uh, you know we build it and it works it has never happened where people ask for something we right. built it and they did not want it it's just that simple but what happened the founders hs no i know better 
and when that founder it overtakes your uh, uh, you know people's uh, ask i think that's where you start losing so we've just stuck to that it's always helped us wonderful and you know the 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 flip side of that nischal is that as a founder you also want to in theory maximize optionality which will make you spread yourself too thin because you feel like well i want to do this as well and i want to do defi as well and i want to do algorithmic you know uh, you know banking and give you know yield farming cut solutions as well etc whereas the core might be just that hey look this is the onboarding and ramp from you know fiat to crypto and and back and and we're going to do that the best in the world so how do you resist that temptation as well one is the features right what do you launch and not how do you resist the temptation to get into 15 different pies cuz it's all emerging yeah see i think uh, i i don't think i'm resisting the uh, you know the need to get into all the features what i'm uh, trying to do is time it re- well for example i give you an example of uh, we uh, margin trading is something that uh, again we've been asked for by our customers and it's a lot lot of people asking for it um, and we want to build it and we will definitely build it but here's the problem we don't see that kind of liquidity existing so what will happen is if you bring in margin trading and there is a, a let's say a big dip in crypto prices there will be liquidations and there will be issues with the way you handle those liquidations because the india market is not liquid enough for uh, the margin that you know we can support at our scale so we have to wait for it so i i see this more about you know what we have to understand is what is the timing for those asks because there are a lot of futuristic asks also so just understanding that timing is going to be the key and in our market we look at data because now we are growing we understand that uh, now the market is ready for this feature uh, the people are asking for it let's launch it so it's just about timing i think timing is the key uh, it's not about uh, you know spreading yourself too thin i believe that we want to keep building we will build 20 more features but when to build is going to be the key and i think that is where we uh, use our uh, understanding of data and uh, you know the markets to time it well i think that is what is uh, probably our job absolutely in fact in early stage venture also we have to figure that out while it's very very hard to figure out timing whenever there's a pull from the market like your example as well of azirex that you launched it even without having a product ready saying hey we're going to do an exchange of course you were quite uh, actively followed on uh, on on twitter even in your past life and then with india wants hashtag india wants crypto uh, that you got 40000 sign ups with no product that is the biggest pmf signal right <laughs> uh, yeah that, absolutely that one can have right so i think any signal where you're saying you know hundreds of people so not launching me, yeah go ahead yeah for me i think one of the other uh, reason why i also launched early was one is i i'm very restless and uh, with an exchange you can't be restless with putting the product out because there's a lot of security features a lot of uh, things to be done right the second was i also was getting into a market which is crowded there were already seven eight exchanges we were not an innovation you know or anything so i wanted to understand whether it was just me thinking of these gaps or did they exist and when you saw that 40 50000 people signing up then you know for sure that there is a problem uh, so so you know it sort of also gave me uh, more than pmf it also told me that the market is uh, open even now and i think that was uh, helpful uh, th- that reminds me of an interesting question you know often people talk about a first mover advantage and people underestimate the advantage of a late mover advantage right uh, sorry pun intended and because but at the same time did you just primarily focus just on your insights and the customer insights and and your active sort of twitter engagement with the community or did you also see what the other exchanges and others had that did make sense right and was useful and say look i'm not going to do that because you know like 10 other people are doing that and i'm going to even of the insights i have let me go in a more blue ocean rather than just try to out compete with them on what they already have no i i think yeah uh, i i used to do that before what you said uh, which is you know if a competitor has it i want to be different now i'm shameless uh, if a competitor has it it works i'm going to build it uh, it does not matter because uh, you know it's not about our egos or us being like i said you know we have to somewhere as founders keep ourselves aside of who we are and think about what our users want and uh, uh, i definitely looked at uh, and i think competition is always the best it's in fact more much more difficult to be the first mover and innovate it's a lot harder uh, competing is i think uh, at least for me has been a lot easier and the best thing is you can learn from the mistakes of others so that you don't have to repeat it so i i definitely did my research i in fact the reason i built an exchange was i used one of the competitors and it took me a week to buy my first bitcoin and by that time the bitcoin prices had shot up 
So I realized there was this problem with existing exchanges. But yeah, you should learn from them. You should build the things that work for their customers because you know the customers are the same. And, and that's what we do, do all the time. Uh, but now I think we are in that stage where we are building uh, some like P2P, for example, that was an innovation. Nobody had a peer-to-peer -peer system when the banking ban was coming in India. We built it for the first time and then everyone else copied it. Uh, but yeah, it, there's a mix of both. You need to innovate where it's needed and you need to learn from your competition where it's needed. Right. And also depends, Nishal, you went from being the kind of challenger to becoming the incumbent. Right. So you are now, you know, the largest exchange. So now there are other people who are trying out Wazirx and saying what's missing or what's lacking or whatever as, as founders. Uh, and I'm sure you will keep doing well. But nonetheless, we are both you and I are both pro entrepreneurship. So I think it's very different when you're the, you know, the leader or the incumbent and when you're the challenger. Right. Because you have to get the ball rolling. Uh, but anyway, yeah, on that I, note, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I know. I, I understand. It's, uh, life comes a full circle, you know. <laughs> right. Um, so what are some uh, emerging trends that you see of new things that either customers are asking for or trends that you see emerging, right? We at Prime Ventures do a lot in fintech. Uh, and, you know, so are there other interesting applications uh, that you're seeing already emerge in the Indian context uh, or either being pulled from the customer side or even from the, on the B2B side, right? On the, uh, on, on the classic sort of uh, real world, old world finance, NBFCs, banks, et cetera. Are there any interesting use cases that you're seeing get done beyond just, you know, asset exchange trading and so forth? Sure. I think, uh, see, while again, timing is going to be prime out here, but I think uh, on the B2B side, what you spoke about, uh, there's a plethora of things not done. Uh, first example, white labeled uh, crypto exchanges, because I believe as regulation, we get near it. Every bank, every financial institution would want to offer this to their customers. And being able to service them with uh, you know, the right uh, software for them to make it happen. Because building this software is one of the more difficult ones. But I think you can commoditize this uh, to a large extent so that all the financial institutions can provide. And that's a great opportunity. Uh, the second is custody. Custody is still not really a completely solved problem. Uh, both institutional custody. I think retail custody, there are still international products, ledger and all. Again, very expensive. 7,000, 6,000 rupees for a ledger device. I don't think it's for uh, you know us in India right now to buy, but someone can build an India solution. But there are also custody solutions for uh, corporates and institutions that have not been built for, uh, from an India perspective. Um, and then there are quite a few, but I'm not a B2B guy, so I wouldn't have deep insights there. Uh, but in B2C, what is happening is the, the beautiful thing is uh, now, because we have about 15 to 20 million people in India, now the Indian market is uh, priming up for decentralization. So let's say a, a year or a year and a half ago, if you were building a decentralized protocol or a solution for India, I wouldn't be a big believer because the market was small. There were 5 million, 6 million people. And let's say 10 to 15% of the people get into DeFi right now. So that's about 500, 600K people that you have to reach out. Uh, that's your total market. It's too small. Now what is happening is you have 1 to 2 million people in India who are open to DeFi decentralization. So now I, I'll, I, we are seeing that emergence of DeFi protocols, and de uh, decentralized apps focused on the Indian market. And I think that is going to grow. And in the next uh, two to three years, I believe uh, India will cross 100 million people in, in, in crypto or holders of crypto. And what will happen is you will have there those 10, 20, 30 million people who want to be into DeFi. Uh, so that will be like the rapid growth in the next, I think the next uh, three to four years that is going to happen. So now is a great time to build uh, for decentralization. And the best thing about decentralization is you don't have to worry about local laws and regulations. You don't have to run India Wants Crypto campaign. It's amazing. You just have to be a developer and an entrepreneur and just build. So I think uh, that is going to be the next evolution. Yeah, Nishal, just to make it real for our listeners, are there examples of uh, sort of very low-hanging fruit? I don't mean like startup ideas. I just mean what do customers, what do consumers want in DeFi? Is it just, you know... Uh, yield farming or making some, you know, value out of their assets or are there certain basic things, right? Or lending or you know, what is it that is some of the early ones that you think will uh, succeed? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, for I'll give you an example of, uh, I think the first step will be probably a crossover from uh, centralization to decentralization. Like in the US, there are products which uh, uh, are centralized and uh, you put in your assets and then they use decentralized protocols to give you a better yield. So we could start with that for India uh, right now, where you know a centralized uh, kind of a service where I can put my 
assets and then they'll use the decentralized because decentralization is still hard for people uh, who are new into crypto to use DeFi protocol directly. So that crossover apps will come. So the first generation was us completely centralized where we just helped you get into decentralization. The second generation is going to be, uh, you know, CFI and DeFi. So centralized and uh, decentralized together. And probably then after that, it will be the third generation, which is purely DeFi. So right now you can look at those crossovers, no need to innovate and build a completely new product for India, but to help India on board to these uh, existing yield farming and staking and everything that you can think of. I don't think we have more than a few tens of maybe 10, 20,000 people into these uh, protocols today from India. So how do you take this to a million people in India being involved in these uh, protocols? I think that's where uh, the opportunities are right now. Wonderful. Um, as we sort of come towards the end of the podcast here, what have you learned about yourself as an entrepreneur uh, in this journey, right? In what way have you evolved? There's of course the whole, you know, Web3 and blockchain and, you know, crypto and so forth, but uh, what have you learned and what do you use for yourself to stay current? Because the rate of pace here, I remember in the Web2 era, we had this concept of a web year. A web year was like, you know, like a year in 10 years of, of you know, uh, pre-internet, right? Now it seems like Web3 is like three weeks, right? right. Uh, before something completely changes from scratch. So how do you stay abreast, uh, both at a personal and a professional level? Yeah, I think what I've learned about myself is I, I, I think I've not been thinking big enough. Every time I build something, I, then I realize that I've not thought big enough. And I think, uh, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, uh, the bigger we can think because the risk is the same, the everything is the same. Uh, so, you know, think bigger than the biggest that you can think you are thinking. And I think that's a, a great lesson I've learned. Um, in terms of how do you stay abreast, the thing is, uh, I've also realized at least for crypto, you cannot know everything. Um, and so the other approach is to probably, you know, the other approach is where you see these uh, maximalism evolving. The reason is what happens is uh, if you try to understand a lot of things, uh, you're not good at any of these things in crypto. Um, so you have these maximalists. For them, what happens is they have a domain. You're a maximalist in Ethereum. You'll understand everything about Ethereum. You're a Bitcoin maximalist. You know everything about it and you don't know anything about the rest. So that's one approach. But I've taken a middle path, which is I, I'm, I'm saying I'm okay with people telling me uh, things in crypto, which I don't understand and I'll learn it. And I'm okay with knowing some of the things around uh, most of the chains out there. Uh, so I, I read up about uh, new blockchains that evolve, uh, new uh, consensus algorithms that come up, new attempts at building, uh, uh, you know, new DeFi protocols and all. But honestly, um, it's it's huge and and it's very complicated. I see, I'm a techie, and when I see some of these uh, DeFi protocols, they have so much of finance in them that gets a little difficult for me too. So I, I try to stick to the tech part of it. And I think um, it's just interesting whenever you have time, um, there's never a day where uh, you know everything in crypto. So uh, I see this more as a, you know, a fun um, a time out for me to learn new things. And, um, and I usually reach out to younger people. The other day I wrote to someone who's I think uh, in, in college right now. And uh, I was asking about uh, play to earn games. He's a, he's a player in Axie Infinity. So some 17, 18 year old making one and a half lakhs playing games on Axie Infinity. And, you know, it's amazing to hear these stories and learn from them. So that's what I do on Twitter. There's a lot to learn like that. Absolutely. And no, I'm, I'm very grateful for all of what you share, especially with uh, India wants crypto. I've sort of follow that quite, uh, quite actively. Uh, it is thanks, those, thanks a lot. For, for those that don't, I, I strongly recommend following this chill on Twitter. We'll, we'll link to his Twitter handle. And certainly the hashtag India wants crypto. So thank you so much, Nishchal, for uh, being on the Prime Venture Partners podcast. I have a dozen more questions, but maybe we'll bother you again uh, in, in, in Web3 years, which might be three weeks from now. <laughs> for sure. Thanks a lot, Amit. Thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Dear listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Subscribe now on your favorite podcast app for free and you'll be the first one to know when new episodes are available. Just search for Prime Venture Partners Podcast in Apple Podcast, Spotify, CastBox or however you get your podcasts. Then hit subscribe. And if you have enjoyed the show, we would be really grateful if you leave us a review on Apple Podcast. To read the full transcript, find the link in the show notes.